in a sort of Nietzschean kind of way. Yeah, I haven't read the Wilson translation yet. I've only read the uh, Lip Lipson. It is so, Lipson, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. Are we going to have a reference text, uh, a common reference text that we're all reading of that? I'll be reading this version. Ashton and I will be reading this version, right? So um, that would be the Wilson version, but they're so close. It might be interesting to have both translations at, at play. Um, just to compare differences. So I, I won't, what do you think, Ashton? I don't think we should insist on one translation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because if people already have the text and a different translation, then it might be interesting just to note, you know, the differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just I'd like to add that that I mean yes, valuable, but it I mean if you want to, then you want to also cross reference the German if you're going to do that as well, because otherwise it's just like he says this, he says this, but okay, yeah, yeah. Where the common source is becomes like the real reference point, i.e. the German. But we're not all German speakers, though. So exactly, that's my point. That's, it that's my point. A lot of, yeah. well, <laughs> Angus is going to help us, I hope, with that. If there's anything if, especially yeah, important if, to note, yeah, yeah, and not only reference to the German, but the the two original German editions, hmm. like 19, 1894 and 1914 or 18, whatever the second one was, right? But I mean, those are those are those are catered for in the addendums as well, aren't they? Here, is that what you're referring to, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it depends on what we want to have happen. In this reading i haven't read it before so i'm this is totally new to me so some of you may have read it half a dozen times so i believe that it's possible that beginners and very advanced readers of this particular text can get along just fine <laughs> so that's what i want to have happen thank you yeah sounds like a good plan but let's not get ahead of ourselves we have a few chapters left here of riddles of philosophy um chapter six today um i can say a few things but does anyone want to lead us in I, I i wanted to respond to uh jeff barney and something that uh he said last time mm -hmm. and i also would like to uh thank you matt for recommending tarnas epilogue mm -hmm. and the stuff on the double bind which i think is extremely important I also wanted to thank, I think it's Alex from Sweden. I don't know if he's on the call today, but he also mentioned um, something about scientific spirituality and how that isn't going down very well in mm. Sweden and the, 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 uh, the Steiner communities there seem to have a problem with outreach. Anyway, I thought all of those kinds of things could be summarized very briefly by myself. Uh, because I have a little map that I would like to share, but I don't, we don't have to do that right away. We can go right into this, uh, this chapter if someone wants to, um, because I really like this chapter, especially stuff on Fechner, made total sense to me. So mm -hmm. thank you all very much. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, uh, I'm, I might mm -hmm. just say, um, it feels like um, the book's coming to a kind of a crescendo here. So there's one more chapter before he reaches Anthroposophy in the final chapter. And it's interesting, the next chapter ends with Einstein. Uh, and so the theory of relativity and so forth um, mm -hmm. in relation to modern natural scientific conceptions. With this one, modern idealistic world conceptions, he starts by saying, that natural science was blended with the idealistic traditions. So these two different things we can be bouncing from, you know, natural scientists to idealistic thinkers. And here we're finding people that are blending it. And, you know, so it, it, it feels like the whole book's reaching a, a kind of a crescendo, but, it, you know, we find a lot of disappointment in here as well, even though that there's so much um, richness in, in, in what's happening with these thinkers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a helpful observation, Jonathan. Yeah, I was struck by the way several times Steiner returns to this question of um, 
Plato and Aristotle's uh, hope for philosophy, I guess, and that it would have something to do with giving us knowledge of our own immortality, if I'm if I'm capturing that right, and that these thinkers, as deep as they were, von Hartmann in particular, and Hammerling, Fechner, uh, Lotze, didn't seem capable of penetrating to that level in their own free thinking and creative thinking that would have granted them some assurance of personal immortality, individual immortality, even if they might have grasped some sense of uh, ongoingness as part of what the world spirit or what have you. Um, something was blocking them from this, from grasping it, confidence in their own individual immortality. What do you think, Angus? You're muted. I'm going to back you 100% in that statement, just with uh, a line uh, where we're talking about, uh, he's, he's talking about uh, Hartmann and Schopenhauer. And then he goes on to say, the conceptions of natural science derive their certainty from observation of the external world. Within one's soul, one does not find the strength that would guarantee the same certainty. Um, and I think this is uh, another way of expressing exactly what you're saying, that we've got the certainty of mathematical thinking. We've got the certainty of experience of natural scientific thinking, the it's like observation that in, even though he starts talking about experiments, but it's like this passive uh, approach to uh, to uh, knowledge. Um, but mm -hmm. the strength that's needed to take that to inside is still lacking um, in these people. And I think he actually repeats that idea probably about four or five times just in this this single chapter alone, um, uh, which again is building this idea that's been going on for many chapters now about how philosophy is uh, is going to die if it doesn't find a, find a way forward. Um, so, yeah, mm. so if I share that. Yeah. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yes, in reference to that, on, on one page in this edition, he mentions twice what is required. In the English, it's described as the inner strength and elasticity of mind. So it, it, it's, it's interesting to, to know. I'm kind of in two minds about it in that we started in ancient Greece where there was, there was life in the mind. They had a sense of um, uh, the living spirit in their natural bodily, you know, in their body, in their environment, just a, 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 as a kind of undivided whole. And then these things separated out. Uh, and um, uh, I, my two minds are, uh, uh, it, it, is it just that thought is kind of like dwindling and sort of reaching last legs? Or is it more that it, it, it was so young, it's, it's still gaining the strength um, that, that it requires for where it's going? Hmm. Hmm. Seems at least it's lost its confidence. This this idea of the importance of confidence in one's thinking comes up repeatedly in the post-Kantian doubt, post-Cartesian maybe, but especially post-Kantian doubt in our own thinking capacity. Um, it seems to be part of what's at issue. His um, when he's speaking about homiling, I think uh, this he mentions again this point that. He makes in one of the prefaces where the world riddles that are pursued by the soul are felt as a kind of hunger, like a necessary, you know, nutrition, and that um, these thinkers are sort of struggling um, in their, at least Hammerling and a couple others, in their register of uh, the, that need, but but the world conditions, um, so like these tendencies of thought they're sort of meeting as well. And so it's interesting to just think about how like 
in order for those riddles, you know, and, and I guess that need of the soul to be um, met, also is, there's this necessity for the sort of cultural thought conditions to be conducive for it, which they weren't, because there's this overemphasis on the, you know, the uh, mechanical picture of natural science. Mm -hmm. I see your hand, Lorenzo. Yep. Um, yeah, I I really like the this chapter, and I think it's rather mysterious in that it uh, starts uh, building uh, the foundations for understanding um, this concept that we've been already dealing with that of the living thought and uh i would like to link some uh some quotations from the from the chapter because i think there is um uh, a discourse underlying them that uh steiner doesn't really um make explicit at least not at this stage of the book but I think there is there is something here. Uh, I yeah, I'd like to start with uh, a, a quote from uh, Fechner. Uh, no, it's Steiner talking about Fechner. He says that he feels stimulated to such an elevation through his intimate contemplation of the world of the senses, which reveals to his thinking more than the mere sense perception would be capable of disclosing. This additional content he feels inclined to use in imagining extrasensory entities. In his way, he strives thus to depict a world into which he promises to introduce thoughts that have come to life. So uh, Steiner, he, he connects now, yeah, this, uh, idea of extrasensory entities with the the living thoughts. Then, uh, uh, when um, quoting Hartmann, uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, Hartmann says, outside man, an unconscious will rules in things that endows them with the possibility of becoming real. So I, I read that again. Outside man, an unconscious will rules in things endowing them with the possibility of becoming real. So uh, here we see that the same um, idea of an external entity is brought about again. But uh, this time it is linked with uh, the irrationality, uh, uh, the, this unconscious will, it's irrational, but this very irrationality and those things with uh, their being real, the, their reality. And so, uh, I started to think, well, is this an equation between life and will? Are we saying that living thoughts are living and thus have a will? And what has a will is perceived as irrational from the outside. And what does really this irrationality mean here? Is this a, a fundamental concept or is, or is it just uh, irrational because uh, we cannot predict it, we cannot understand it. And so I would like to, to link one third quote. This is about the value of uh, experiment in scientific research. And uh, Steiner uh, quotes Wundt, but then uh, he, he limits what he said. Wundt was saying that with experiment, uh, the whole field of psychology could be explored, but then Steiner uh, limits this by saying, 
uh, it is doubtless only in a borderline territory of the field of psychology that the experiment is really fruitful. That is, in the territory where the conscious processes lead to the backgrounds of the soul life, where they are no longer conscious but material processes. Here, uh, I feel as if Steiner is telling us that uh, experiment uh, loses its its significance, or at least its um, uh, yeah, its, its significance uh, when coming to the really living parts. He says also the psychical phenomena in the proper sense of the word can, after all, only be obtained by a purely spiritual observation. That is. Uh, our actual method of uh, experiment uh, has no value with living things. And so again, back to the idea of that life has will, and since it has will, it is unpredictable. If it is unpredictable, then we call it irrational. So we, we can maybe link all these thoughts together and... Uh, and maybe, uh, yeah, see, uh, see here uh, uh, in uh, emergence, what maybe would be studied today by chaos theory uh, as the the breaking point of of the experiment uh, or of the of the experimental protocols that we use, and so. Uh, is is actually uh, the the dividing line between a living thought and uh, just a material aspect, a dead aspect. Uh, what we study today in um, nonlinear dynamics in in chaos theory is it that the point? What do you think? Can can I respond to that? Some of that. Can you? Um, Thank you, Lorenzo. I, I have read Fechner, and so I'm a little confused about this uh, personal immortality. Um, Fechner, actually, he, he was blind at one point in his life. He had a, a spiritual crisis, and he was blind, and he regained his sight, and that was a, a very important turning point for him. Um, I think the way Steiner reads is interesting and worth considering. So I'm quoting from William Irwin Thompson in Imaginary Landscapes. Uh, he's a very uh, cultural historian, recently passed away. I think a very brilliant person. He's talking about Steiner and his, his model of Steiner um, in cosmic memory I could only take it in as a form of mysticism that had absolutely nothing to do with science. It was its own world, very much like science fiction. And like science fiction, it could have various poetic truths, but one could not take its narratives as descriptions of our conventional world. Actually, however, was just what Stein was claiming for himself in his project of reading the Akashic records. What then was one to make of descriptions of stages in human evolution in which the human body floated in the sea was not yet male and female, but produced offspring singly from within itself, or was cold-blooded. Steiner described evolution on the planets and talked about the separation of the sun and moon from the earth and a stage of evolution on Saturn, but it was obvious from his descriptions that these places were dimensions and not simply planets out there in space. And in fact, one could not think of dimensions and space in the normal way and make any sense of the way he explained things. One had to put Steiner in a separate file along with Casey Tolkien and Castaneda and other alternative cosmologies. And he goes on to say, and I think this is, fits in with the, with the spiritual science and what I think Steiner means by that. If Steiner chooses to look at the evolution of the solar system and sees ways in which the planets are not hunks of stuff out there, but nodes of vibration that resonate in multiple dimensions that enfold themselves into one another in patterns of complex recursiveness in which sun, moon, and Saturn are also modalities of earth. 
then he is not raving, but is expanding our notions of cosmology. Sounds like chaos theory almost. If he talks about the human body floating in the sea, and after the integration of the I, personal pronoun I, still having a number of parts that were still on the plant level, is talking about the human body as the evolution of the eukaryotic cell and the vestigial plant parts as the organelles, such as the mitochondria. If Steiner says, thus the first likenesses of man were eaters of animals and of men, he is far back in time with the amoebas and protists, just as when he is talking about how every human being could produce another human being out of himself. He is talking about life at the state of the prokaryotic cell. He goes on to say, the Steinerian vision is one that looks at the human as completely embedded in vegetable, animal, and mineral evolution of the solar system. So he's saying Steiner's identification with the biosphere is total. Um, but Steiner did not get his information from his colleagues and his followers now tend to be humorous, rigid, and doctrinaire. So how can one accept a science of the spirit that speaks about clairvoyant vision and ends up in yet another cult. If, he try, if we try to avoid the errors in thinking of the dominant academic institutions, we seem to fall into yet another set of errors in subcultures and cults. So I think this was written in, in the 80s. I think William Irwin Thompson was already very familiar with these dynamics of cults and personalities and clairvoyance and mediums and um, how a materialist reductive science takes off of the table everything that isn't materialist and reductive. And so I think we're still, and that I think is that, that, uh, that possibly a really creative tension um, that, that we're in the midst of right now as these, as these huge uh, shifts in our consciousness are, are occurring. So that's a response to um, what you were offering to us, Lorenzo. And I think it does have uh, something to do with uh, some of the paradoxical communications that are happening here. Um, and um, maybe I'll get a chance before this session ends where I could uh, offer some of the, what, what some, a model that I am developing. Um, I, I, and I'm thinking of myself as a pragmatist here a Persian pragmatist trying to share a semiotic model. So I hope that could be of use to our uh, ongoing communications. So thank you. Thanks, John. Always happy to hear from William Irwin Thompson. Um, I, just one, one response for Lorenzo, and then I see your hand, Angus. Um, I mean, it's, this is more of a, a question, but I kind of detected in Steiner's remarks about Fechner um, that he felt Fechner was giving, like he says, Fechner gave poetic interpretation to logical ideas and, and scientific ideas, or uh, he says that Fechner engaged in the kind of art of speculation. And, um, imagining these extrasensory entities and so on. And I just wondered if Steiner was suggesting that there might have been a bit of arbitrariness. You know, he didn't say the science of speculation. Um, and he, while he seems appreciative of, of Fechner's efforts, it, I just felt like he was suggesting that his view of the spiritual world was not, not scientific, but more artistic, more poetic, more um, speculative and not scientific in the sense that a spiritual science would be. I wonder if anyone else felt that way in his characterizations of Fechner. Uh, go ahead, Angus. Yeah, go ahead. So many points. Uh, wait, um, I'll, I'll go all the way back to Lorenzo. Um, <clears throat> I had a different reading of him reintroducing Schopenhauer here. Um, Schopenhauer uh, two, three chapters back was presented as it's like the will is unreasonable. There's, there, there is no rhyme or reason in it, but I'll just read so like one particular sentence, uh, here, 
He says, Hartman therefore regards the world process as a gradual destruction of the unreasonable will by the reasonable world of ideas. And my, my reading of that is that it's like the invisible world of the will, which of course, if it's invisible, seems unreasonable, is starting to be permeated with the light of thinking and therefore becomes less unreasonable. So I, I think he's actually moving on from, it's like a, a simple so Schopenhauerian view of the will and saying, look, this guy, Brent, this guy uh, Hartman, he's taken it a step further and he's saying it's like thinking has an important role here. Uh, I do think you're definitely onto something with so like uh, uh, so that the, the, a source of life. I w I'd be quite happy linking it in with so the Christian Trinity principle of the Father, the unbegotten begotter, um, that which is invisible until light, the Holy Spirit, uh, so like casts its light on it. I would be, uh, John was talking about models by which we could uh, understand this. I think uh, the Trinity is uh, it's like a very interesting model for seeing different dynamics play out in the whole of this book but uh, that can be a topic for another conversation. Um, another point that I thought was uh, interesting here was uh, my understanding of experimental psychology was also a slightly different reading from your own. I saw, I, I read Steiner as saying that it's useful in, it's like in, uh, in borderland territory, uh, as opposed to so like deep soul. Uh, it's like it's like a comprehensive uh, understanding of the soul. So that was my own personal reading of it, which leads us or leads me to um, perhaps like another essential part of this chapter for me. In Steiner's theory of evolution of consciousness, we are living in the consciousness soul age. What does that mean? It means becoming consciously aware at an individual level that we are soul beings. And all of these people that are beginning to experiment in psychology, uh, so, I mean, these, these ideas, I mean, if you, if you go to the Orient, they've got like theories of subconsciousness and unconsciousness and all of these type of states. They, they had them thousands of years ago, but it's new for the um, for the Western mind, it's like it's only been around for a hundred years or less, and uh, we've got so like Jung and Freud and all of these people popping up so like shortly after these guys. But I see uh, what Steiner's describing here as a manifestation of so the growth of an awareness of the consciousness soul, an essential part of our being, where we are becoming aware at an individual level that we are soul that we have individual souls. Um, and that is still a weak feeling in, in, in most of humanity. And this is one of the reasons, there are lots, this is one of the main reasons why there's such of a lack in the trust of thinking. There's not that inner certainty, but as uh, awareness of, so that the reality of my own inner being grows in me, that certainty, gradually disappears and the elasticity of mind that's required that is something that is part of growing this process bringing the will into the process of creating images inner images so that it's not just an empty theory but it's something that becomes a living experience um, in the being so I think there's 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 a there's an intimate relationship to so this possibly a uh, slightly complicated term of consciousness soul, which is supposedly so like humanity's project for has been for 500 years and is for another 1500 years. So um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of uh, where my thinking went, thanks to Lorenzo's comments. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, just uh, a short in interjection and then i'll let you and let you speak jeff uh yeah what the reason i brought about chaos theory was exactly to undermine the idea that uh, uh 
the external will that allow endows reality is uh, necessarily irrational so that the the quality of irrationality that has been given to it actually may may just be a, a judgment of unpredictability or chaoticity yeah thanks Uh, why don't you go ahead next, Jeff, and then Teresa, and then Jonathan. Uh, okay, um, just a few um, reiterations of some of the language that's been used here that I think points to the the um, the reality that the soul will not be denied. That there's a not only a hunger, but the satisfaction of the soul is as primary again in this chapter as it has been previously. Um, uh, we can talk about what the soul is, but um, one thing it's not going to be denied is participation in the world um, as knowledge. And <clears throat> uh, he uses the terms uh, speculation. Uh, we've used the term passivity. Um, uh, the, the, the idea of experiment uh, the idea of immortality as something given that you could find somewhere. Um, uh, the idea that um, the soul is now maybe youthful, that it's in a it's it's not uh, thinking isn't dead. Thinking is being reborn here, in in a different sphere. This kind of goes to dimensionality too, I think. Um, uh, and then. Um, and so what does that mean? Uh, in, and so in my mind, it sort of, uh, this alludes to uh, what I mentioned in the previous one about subjectivity and the importance of needing to create subject, subjective experience uh, of, of the self-conscious ego. Um, but in the previous chapter, he, he describes the way in which that's a dangerous road because, um, because then we close off the ego, sort of entomb it in the soul. And here there's the danger that we see with um, linking psychology to physiology and making that uh, an absolute ground on one hand. And, um, and so uh, I, I guess what I'm really kind of trying to say is that this is the, the we're, sta we're at the dawn of the age of psychology as a study, as a field of study uh, that really hasn't happened yet. I mean, people use the term, but it certainly wasn't formalized into institutional life. And then we have uh, the beginnings of existentialism, which is um, uh, uh, an uncompromising, um, uh, an unprejudiced uh, attempt to look at the soul. And then he brings up Brentano, who goes halfway there in the phenomenology department, um, literally and figuratively, um, and he seems to be suggesting that in, uh, that in order to have a science of the soul, it's going to the forms in the soul are going to have to be created in order to study them. And so we're at, I think what we're talking about is creative participation in lawful ways in in the soul to to create a field of study. Uh, uh, that we could call psychology, and 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 again, that never happened uh, formally. It's uh, except with, as far as I can see, uh, in the modern world, with 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 a consciousness soul present, uh, uh, had hasn't happened in a um, uh, in a way that meets um, the birth of this new capacity within within the soul as self-created hmm. uh teresa do you want to share your comment now and I, i'll hold some reflections for you jeff i i see jonathan's hand is up yeah why don't why don't you go first uh he's okay. had a, a few chances to speak Okay, um, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so there was a few um, strings of thought and discussion on this chapter, um, but I'll just hone in on 
when Angus was talking about the individual's um, recognition of where we're going in the direction, hopefully, that we are soul beings, um, I was connecting the reading of this chapter where Rudolf Steiner talks about the ancient Greeks a number of times. He links to that. And so my question throughout this book, and particularly more so in this chapter, um, and I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts here, um, is what's not in the chapter and Indian philosophy. And uh, so he does refer to um, the way of being um, or living thoughts and uh, living closer to nature in the ancient Greeks' time. And I wonder if he hasn't discussed Indian philosophy and yoga practice and how um, with, with yogic philosophy and the recognition of spirits, um, he hasn't brought that in yet because of the time of the publication or time of writing. I, I know that many of these chapters were written at it. So, yeah, I, I probably have to research that a bit more but thank you that's a that's a great question Teresa. I, I've, I've been thinking about this lately too because i'm reading a book by raymond panikar who was part indian and uh, identified as a christian and a hindu and a buddhist but anyway um i found myself and i just shared this quote from the chapter uh where steiner was talking about homerling and just the you know as, as others have mentioned, like um, what is necessary for thinking to be, you know, sort of reignited and this, this uh, experience of the ego to be, you know, um, arrived at through this sort of inner practices that, you know, that Steiner taught through anthroposophy and how much those I've recently been learning more are sort of, you know, you know, definitely coming out of the theosophical influence um, and just how much they are like the mantric sayings, um, you know, that come out of Indian philosophy. So anyway, I think that's a great question. I'd be really uh, curious to read, you know, anything Steiner's written that is more historical um, in consideration of, you know, Indian philosophy and like this, but I'm not aware of it. Can I comment on on this just a little bit? Because um, uh, this is the the Christ that's in the room now um, in in evolutionary history. So um, it's not that <clears throat> Steiner didn't have commentary on on um, uh, various spiritual traditions and their practices uh, necessarily. Um, it is that he's focusing on um, giving birth to practices for a, for an age that's appropriate to our time, I would say. And some of that discovery is also physiological evolutionary discovery, um, which is, um, I'm just starting to get into this now, uh, much uncovered, um, um, uh, let's see, not much uncovered, uh, not much covered within, um, um, uh, Waldorf education or any of the other uh, forms that utilize uh, um, practices and um, uh, institutional methods for human development. But the seven life processes are part of an, uh, a physiological evolutionary um, phase, uh, uh, sort of phaseology, and, and we're in one of those phases. And so I think what he's doing is pertinent to our time is all I all I mean to say, not negating any other traditions or uh, be, uh, creating some sort of uh, exceptionalist um, um, Western worldview, but trying to make that worldview grow back out of itself, metamorphose out of itself. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. I was going to uh, say that... Um... I remembered early on one of his prefaces to him giving some reason for why he's focusing on um, the West, ancient Greece to the present European uh, mode of philosophy. And I can't find exactly where he said that. Maybe I'm misremembering, but he does say he claims, um, which is a matter of 
you know, a great uh, dispute in a more pluralistic um, world, at least within academic philosophy nowadays, where there's this real effort to develop a, a world philosophy that's not um, just the Eurocentric version of philosophy, but there are still important reasons to note the differences that in different um, cultural streams and their approaches to to thinking or what the Greeks refer to as philosophy. But he does say on page, Steiner's claim on page 27 um, in part one, chapter one, he says that the first epoch of the development of philosophical views begins in Greek antiquity. Uh, it is the age of awakening thought life. Prior to this age, the human soul lived in imaginative symbolic thought pictures. Um, and he mentions in particular, um, you know, Egypt and Indian uh, civilizations. He says, what may at first glance seem to resemble the element of thought in Oriental and Egyptian world conceptions proves on closer inspection to be not real thought, but parabolic symbolic conception. It is in Greece that the aspiration is born to gain knowledge of the world uh, and its laws by means of an element that can be acknowledged as thought um, and that we would still recognize it as thought in the present age. So that's Steiner's claim. Um, you know, as I mentioned, that might be controversial. On the other hand, you know, even postmodernists like Richard Rorty agreed that philosophy as such is a Greek invention. And that while other civilizations definitely engaged in, um, you know, ad advanced uh, reflection upon the nature of existence and the natural world and so on, Rorty would say it's it wasn't philosophy in the sense that we would recognize it in the European tradition inheriting Greece. So that's a very long conversation, but I just wanted to point us back to the beginning of this text to see how Steiner weighs in on that question. Um, Jonathan, do you want to chime in? Yes, thanks. Uh, just quickly, because I, I think the, the point here, I kind of just want to restate that is um, if what we're looking for is a science, this is, is, is what we need, because otherwise we're left with everybody's or every culture's or everybody's individual lived experience because if if we each go by our own lived experience of the soul etc you know, how do we relate that to each other and this is why you know science is sort of at least partly why science is necessarily developed um, at a certain point in history and it has been grounded in the external world which we can all agree on you know that's a tree and it develops like this and it's so forth we can gain a science of that so even though we're all becoming more individualized we have a common ground there but then as Lorenzo pointed out if if experiment which modern science is is based on repeatable experimentation and so forth is off the table when we're speaking of the soul and perhaps some how to do with there's a substrate in it which is beyond rationality um what then what form will that science be? You know, how can we move beyond each culture's or individual's own lived experience into something where we, this is where the Christ is worthy of mention as, as, a, as, a, as a universal um, being, uh, something that unites us and is you know, beyond culture, like science. It's, it might be born in a certain place, but it's beyond, it's not owned by any uh, culture or, or, or person. I think that's all I, I can say to that at this point. Hmm. Ashton brought up a good point that maybe, Teresa, you were talking more about the influence on uh, late 18th and early 19th, 19th century German philosophy as a result of some Indian texts being translated. Is that what you were pointing towards? No. Um, no, I just wanted to highlight, um, because yogic practice and yogic philosophy has been around for 
a very long time and um the fact that he has admitted um mm. a lot of that philosophy from these chapters at the moment I, I haven't read um going forward so Indian philosophy recognizes the spirit and and in a way in a sense it is a spiritual science um in speaking with others um you know in the last couple of years I think people were saying that Rudolf Steiner didn't um completely immerse in Indian philosophy because there was the idea of the guru and it took you away from individual development mm -hmm. so that's where I was going but it's interesting um that he may have been influenced by his study of Indian text mm -hmm. right? to get to his spiritual science. I mean, my sense of it would be he would see some of the Vedic wisdom as appropriate for an earlier age and form of, of soul and that for contemporary Westerners to try to import it now would be inappropriate for our form of for what what's needed in our own soul development at this time yes yes i understand i think um but just not to have mentioned it at all is yeah it's is, is interesting mm -hmm. that's because you know there is that um recognition of spiritual science or, or a type of spiritual science so i thought perhaps like um, many of you have already mentioned, that focus on just the European, um, on European or Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to mention something just real quick. Um, so I was, I'm sure, I think most people are familiar with uh, Dale Brunswald, you know, recording Steiner's lectures. And I was listening to Collected Works 110, and I'm not sure what the actual title of that is, but I make notes when I'm listening sometimes when something is important said. And in the first lecture, Steiner's talking about how the sort of esotericism that anthroposophy is trying to bring out to like a wider audience has traveled, he said, from the east to the west and but the way that anthroposophy and you know steiner is sort of seeking to i guess transmit it is in accordance with you know what what has been noted you know jeff and others um that has come with the evolution of consciousness and the sort of you know event of golgotha um and uh, anyway so that's just i just thought of that when Teresa was speaking uh let's uh jeff Corinter and then and then john i'm just um thank you all for this part of the conversation i'm having a tremendous crystallization and this won't take me long at all but um you know as far as dr hahnemann and his medical heil comes you know coming you know, during the romantic era during the consciousness soul phase was precisely for this reason that you know, the technology of medicine is about really saving the individual soul, repairing it, or whatever verb you want to use, for all these reasons, right? This is exactly what is needed in this age of the, the, the form of development we're talking about here that, that we're in right now. Hmm. Uh, John, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. I think Rorty said towards the end of his life that philosophy was becoming a branch of literature. Mm -hmm. He didn't think there was anything that special about philosophy, that it would be separate from literature. Doesn't but he credit I, I, Nietzsche with, with that? <laughs> I, I'm just pausing on, on that thought because I wanted to um, respond a little bit to uh, Jeff's communication um because he directed our attention to look at the Vali presentation and he mentioned that uh that was a separate group um and he also mentioned david and john as being uh, as agitating the boundary okay and 
I listen to Jeff, or let me go to the third person. John, listen to Jeff. Okay, this is something that Steiner recommends we often do is go into the third person. So, and John um, followed that uh, communique on, the, on volley. And there was a discussion between David and Jeff. And so I can't, I'm representing this. You probably can't see this, but there's the separate group. And there's on top, you'll see two figures. That's, uh, that's David and Jeff having a communique. And the separate group, there's an abyss right here. That's the boundary that is agitated. And over here is a, a, a phenomenon group, which the separate group are members of. Okay. So this was my con this was a confusion John had. This seemed to me a highly paradoxical and very creative communique. Paradoxical in the sense that uh, the separate group is both a separate group and it's also participating within the, the group that we're in now. So my, um, my confusion or John's confusion rather was about where is Jeff perceiving? Where's Jeff's perceiver? Where is he perceiving from? And can the participant observers, and over here I have a little, we're all, all these little curly cues, those are all, all of us. Um, so this is a representation. This is the, this is my, I'm a pragmatic, pragmaticist in the Pers Persian tradition because he was a great diagrammer as, as and, the, and so, so are you, Matt. I think you're a great diagrammer as well. Um, so what's happening now, I believe, is a kind of reorganization that's possible. Um, as this is a model, it's my model of Jeff's model. So it's not, I, this is not reality. This is a model. And where could we be going? This is my, once again, I don't know if anyone could see this, my drawing, but this is power of Christ within everyone, okay? This is a Christ figure. He looks oddly Mephistophelian, actually. Um, and I think those, uh, this, the chakra system is spinning, um, which is kind of motif in the previous drawing. Um, and there's the earth, and there's the feet, and there are the, the hands, and the feet, and the earth, okay? And this is a solar being, okay? Christ is a solar being. So I believe this is where we could be moving towards collectively. And this will, of course, can only happen through us as individuals, communicating adequately enough through our paradoxes, impasses, conflicts, so that we aren't uh, re-traumatizing ourselves and splitting off from one another into a separate groups. Now, my, my issue is not, I'm all for different groups rather than separate groups. That's what I would add. Yes, there are some groups that are going to be separate, but how separate can any of us, any group actually be and, and still be an open group? Because anything that gets separate starts to close in and die and shrivel up or become very much a, a cultish kind of orientation or a totalitarian group. So I think these are the kind of tensions and stresses that we all can hold as generously as we can so that we can hold these tensions long enough so that something new can emerge. Okay, so, um, so my question could be, can the participant, participant observers in this group find a space that knows about all of these spaces? I believe we can, but we can't do it without our imaginations. So thank you for this opportunity once again to go to my edge and go beyond the edge because you can't know what the edge is unless you've gone beyond it. Mm, appreciate the diagrams, John. Always helpful. And I, I have been, uh, I've caught up in volley, but I haven't contributed, but I have listened. I, I know the exchange between David and Jeff, uh, which I appreciated. 
glad to see you guys trying to hammer some things out there. I almost think of David and Jeff as being ambassadors from two different groups that they mm. both are members of, ironically, and in a strange kind of way, just because they're communicating to one another. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if um, I'm, I fully understand, <clears throat> but uh, let me take a crack at, um, as, at a response just real quick. Um, when I referred to a separate group, um, I didn't mean it in a in a separatist kind of way, or or I just meant um, I really meant complementary, and I actually think I used that term, but I also wasn't referring to anything that was happening within Volley because I see that as a a a real dovetail to this group uh, and our and our work uh, as organized uh, in this in the way in which Matt and Ashton have organized it. I I was uh, referring to Jonathan Angus and myself who have uh, taken on uh, a, um, uh, a another group that's not necessarily centered around this book, but also quite inspired by this book and inspired by the work of this group. And I, I do see them as uh, isomorphic, uh, potentially, and I'm way open to that. And then the last thing I want to say is uh, the, the, um, the agitation of the boundary I, I was referring to uh, the sort of skin of this group or the boundary of this group, not as an absolute thing, but something that needs to uh, always be um, played with. And that I thought Jonathan, uh, uh, John and um, David's um, role thus far has been helping us to, uh, to, to sort of reconfigure those boundaries. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, we got a few minutes left. Um, chapter seven next time. Um, maybe I'll close us up uh, for this session by sharing just my my summary of the final paragraph of chapter six, where um, Steiner had some helpful summarizing comments to make, where he's basically pointing again to this instinctual feeling that we that the thinkers he's 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 uh exploring have a uh, instinctual feeling for what the zeitgeist is is calling us to do um and as steiner puts it it's really calling us to take conscious responsibility for our own spiritual evolution but he admits this is not easy because we have to first find the means of doing it and it seems as though philosophy as it has traditionally been practiced is not up to the task um you can see in this chapter also how thinking which is the the organ that philosophy engages uh thinking feeling and willing in in these thinkers like hammerling and von hartmann and um and others lots of, are really beginning to distinguish themselves and differentiate themselves which seems to be another part of the task of our age um the thinking i schooled in philosophy for the last few thousand years must discover the connection between its ideas and real natural processes uh, but as we're seeing contemporary thought is not living enough to assure us even of our own existence much less the reality of our ideas of the world and so Steiner's calling us to contact the creative ground of the cosmos within our own creative thinking. That would be my gloss, at least, of this, this last paragraph or two. Does this resonate with, with how you're reading where we're at so far in this, this journey with Steiner? Yeah. I had this question at the end, you know, especially, you know, in consideration of the way he characterized the struggle of the thinkers he considered in that chapter what sort of conditions would support um you know individuals like that in um satiating or at least not satiating completely but um yeah uh, unfolding those potentials and i just thought of anthroposophy you know and the spiritual exercises that are you know just the the whole culture of um igniting individual participation you know um in, in various ways but mm -hmm. all right uh well 
I will see you all next week for chapter seven. Have a good week. Ciao. Bye. Oh, thank you.